for the still shot. Um, <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for uh, dealing with the break that we had to take for Stone Soup after the Boston Poetry Marathon, where I was up um, manning the switchboards and talking my e own ear off for 12 hours. So last week wasn't a good Stone Soup week. This week is a phenomenal Stone Soup week. We have uh, Noah Berlatsky, who, if you look up his name, <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll find him pretty damn near anywhere. Freelance writer, comment, uh, comment, uh, political commentator, uh, arts critic. I knew him all the way back from the Comics Journal when uh, <laughs> when he would tear apart uh, one or two of my favorite cartoon cartoonists. And I remember his infamous I I article on uh, Metallica's Some Kind of Monster. Seek these out. These are worth it. But did you have to tear apart Jeffrey Bound Brown so badly? Um <laughs> That's a two-person joke, but we are uh, we are. I'm thrilled to have him because in the last few years he's uh, broken out as a poet. He has a, a collection out called Not Aula uh, Not Ak Ak Malova. Uh, that's from Ben Yehuda Press this year, and it was a bestseller on Amazon for that brief fiery moment. The way I hope my if my uh, my book is when it comes out in November. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, spam, spam. Come on, you guys, what does it take? Um, but in all seriousness, it'll be great to hear him and his features. You can uh, see his stuff on a number of places. Um, we can you can see us uh, both of us especially on uh, Five Fleas, Itchy Poetry, and Dada Cuckoo, which is the home of uh, short verse. It's very hard to get in those spots, especially Dada Cuckoo. If you write more than six lines to a poem, chances are to the editor's mind you've screwed up. Uh, but Noah's been there pretty consistently, more than me, uh, deservedly so. Uh, but more than but more than that, uh, he's been an oddball in a host of other places. Uh, he was in the recent... <laughs> Stone's throw issue of uh, aim for the thoughts and prayers. So you can uh, you can be thrilled. You can be uh, thrilled to get uh, his introduction. His introduction. You can be thrilled to witness his introduction to well, you and the Stone Soup universe. And we are going now to uh, the open mic. Uh, the Ramnator Five Thousand has selected the poet of uh, Three Rivers. Thankfully. None of them flooding his home this uh, this week, and uh, if the creek don't rise, well, he'll live. Uh, what else can I say? But let's welcome up uh, poet, artist, political commentator. Uh, you can see his illustrations with uh, the recent uh, ethics treatise from uh, David Stephen Joseph Sills. Those are all that guy's name, and uh, I think I might have even got him mixed up, but Richard's been providing illustrations for that, so I appreciate that. Uh, let's welcome him up right now, and I'll shut up. Thank you so very much, my friends. I have a few pieces here that I hope will give you mild amusement, if not indigestion. This first one, a, a tribute to, to the Republicans among us. This is called, but I was going to lie. You promised not to fact check me, but I was only going to lie. Don't you see? You promised not to fact check me. Now I'm well, I was going to fly. You promised not to fact check me. It really cramps my style. I really had a strategy to lose it. Now's a tragedy. It worked for so many a mile. Let them know I'm one of them, not hemmed in. Besides, I'm rich as sin, and they got me over, and I'm no better, Clover. I got more ticks than their old dog, Rover. Especially for the credulous, they really like my style. I pander to their prejudice. It works, it makes them smile. I sneer at all the experts just like them and all them damn professors in their bloody ugly kin. I hate a I fake a hate of technology, spurn immigrants with no apology. Even though I've got a foreign wife, it's just big me. I gotta sacrifice. I tell them they're a Superman. They're victims, everyone. Tell them bouses to go pound sand. They'll be winners, sure as dirt. It's just they got their feelings hurt and everything's against them. Even the color of the sun. But that's just the beginning. Every court is so unfair, especially if their asses were convicted. So there. And then all them highfalutin movie stars riding around in electric cars, unless they say they're purrs like me, they may as well go climb a tree. And if the moon was cheese, there'd be a wholesome breeze and all the cows would give beer. But if they give me their wallets, I'll personally dry each and every honest tear. I'll solve each and every problem. I know why they stub their toes. Just give me all your money. I'll chase away every foreign foe. 
I can play it low and dirty. Insults fly from my mouth. And if you thought I'd grown up at one room shack, instead of I studied at Ivory League and carried a tall book stack. I debated at university, played at fencing, rode at crew. Now I say shucks and drive a pickup. Methods acting is what I do. Paid anyone to take a test. Now I'm posing like a dumbbell. You can guess the rest. But when I hang with bankers and billionaires, I'm erudite and humble. You can see when I'm one of theirs. But when they shine the light of truth like Icarus with his misspent use, my wings all melt and fall away just like this big old burger I see today. And if you love my lies away, were you fact check me today? My whole ensemble, like that king whose kingdom crumbled, wore a suit of no damn thing and thought himself so very cute, but oh no, so badly tumbled, humbled. Oh boy, the crowd did hoot. But all my lies were stripped away. Truth is, I got nothing else to say. And sadly, if you find me all exposed, just like a rose without the pretty coloration of them funny petals, I'm just thorns. It's my only real power. Fact check is a darn damn train wreck. I was going to lie and lie and lie. I wonder why. Maybe, maybe pigs can't fly. And now for something completely different. This is called religion, plain, or peanut. Now I say peanut because I'm deathly allergic to peanuts and any exposure will kill me. Religion, plain, or peanut. How some religionists have come to this insisting on their style of worship with a fist. Enforcing virtue with a sword seems to belie the sacred word that God is love, as is often said, but enforced and tortured, beaten in on someone's head. Maybe somehow you can tease it out and follow this curious, colorific thread. We've heard some talk of God's free will, yet some would enforce, coerce, indoctrinate at the very point of shaking snake. Seems they'd rely on God's good power in a month or a year that it might flower, but others adhere to a belief that you should pray some way or other, or else, my dear, you're in for grief. They believe their cause is just, and therefore, just like them, you must offer prayer as they or vastly nasty harm shall come your way. And as they interpret scripture anyway, just won't do. They have, it seems, a jealous, zealous God who has his own quite special way. If you want the nod, otherwise he's got the rod. Confines designs, it seems, that you should fold your hands just so, or off to Hades, you must go. And any other prayer, it seems, unsettles them and mars their dreams. God's enforcers, they would be. And if you disagree, you may find yourself nailed to a right and proper tree. They did this once, or so I'm told by 10 million statues molded, gilded, gold, and sold. You'll find these little statuettes often round their neck with no regrets. Oh, what the heck. They commemorate, or so it seems, the awful, lawful outcome of his plans and schemes. To buy freedom of your soul. I don't know if this torture is necessary. I'm not so sure. Let's go ask Larry. How exactly is it the painful refrain is quite necessary? It's all under control. It transcends our friends. It's all quite droll. I'm not sure. It's just the way that all the shrieks and screams his fellow rolls. Mm, what the hey? They'd like to enshrine this God's finest hour, like when he succumbed to judicial, prejudicial Roman power. But it's okay. He's later throned above because after the laughter and the refrain of painful disaster, it's all just love above. Anytime I hear you perform, Richard, I have to remind myself to buy one of those oxygen masks for my CPR class and training. Uh, damn, sir. Thank you so much and thank you for being tireless in your uh art and writing as uh, far as commenting on the times um 2020 it was easy to get political art from everyone by 2024 most people have sworn off draw even drawing trump or even uh or even mentioning them in their news feeds um, people are tired and i hope they get some rest after this november um, he also, Richard also has some work coming out in the next Stone's Throw issue called uh, Unalive the Algorithm. That should be coming very shortly as soon as I uh, threaten the artist to get me the uh, work he so valiantly promised me back in the summer when he had time. Anyway, let us go now to someone who was a uh, feature poet last year at Stone Street Poetry, has been an uh, on and off again open micer. I'm glad she's back on for tonight. Let's welcome up Mary Jennings. Thank you, Chad. I'm glad to be back. Well, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, uh, break that um, long streak of non-political poetry. But this one is um, is my second Twilight Zone poem. Um, if you remember, I... Um, I wrote one a few years ago during the pandemic. Um, and this one is based on the episode Four O'Clock. Uh, this was the one with uh, Theodore Bacal playing uh, a reclusive, uh, mentally ill man sending letters of harassment to um, 
to employers, uh, urging them to you know, to terminate employees um, based on their lack of morals. Um, so this one is called Four O'Clock, and it's based on the teleplay by Rod Serling and Price Day and current headlines circa 2024. It's four o'clock now, and the monsters are due to be cut down to size for their lack of virtue, declares the smolder smoldering rancid man with time on his small, gnarly hands. Forever on the card catalog containing all societal ills and their carriers. It is his moral duty to expunge communists, subversives, thieves, harlots, evil. Cruel, craven, weak, his vengeance on strangers who never directly affronted him. No one needs to know him, the smoldering, rancid man, with time on his small, gnarly hands. But he knows all about you and your sins you can never evade without just retribution. When he offers a bone to the FBI, they won't bite. They know he's mad, the smoldering, rancid man, with time on his small, gnarly hands. They deal with cranks like him every day. If they won't collaborate, corroborate, cooperate, then they are part of the evil. It's four o'clock now, and the monsters are due to be cut down to size, the likes of which you've never seen. The smoldering, rancid man, with time on his small, gnarly hands, small of mind, small of heart, small of soul, now small of body, although he was always a small man. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And now I'd like, I'm afraid we're gonna switch back to political or I suspect we will when I bring our next person up of the uh, black, I think she knows who I'm talking about because I think she was fumbling through her papers um, of the Black Seed Writers Group and uh, several other endeavors in the city of Boston. Let's welcome up Jan Rowe. Okay, all right. Hi, well, I couldn't decide what to read about getting caught in a hellstorm or Creamfield Donuts, but here in the Poet of Three Rivers. I'm from around Pittsburgh, PA. That's three different rivers, Ohio, Monongahela, and Allegheny. So I decided to do a tribute to Jimmy Carter as Hurricane Milton is due to hit around midnight after Helene's horrors, hundreds dead. So Jimmy's about 100 years old. He just lost Rosalind. He's considered the last president not to profit from the presidency. So I'm thinking about Hurricane Andrew at the turn of the century. Only the Habitat for Humanity houses survived. Why was that? What's with the real estate developers uh, building regulations or lack thereof. Why did houses built by volunteers, Habitat for Humanity, were the only ones to survive Hurricane Andrew? Thank you. Whoa. That's a good one. Huh? Yeah. To the point. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Jan. And now I'd like to bring up, uh, let's let's uh, go to our storytelling side of Stone Soup and bring up Mr. Bill Lewis. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Happy today. Woohoo! Man, if we weren't here today, we'd be somewhere else. And that would be real bummer. I mean, then we wouldn't be here. So happy today and all of those great things. 
I look at all the news and events and it's uh, overwhelming and I just shut them up because the world knows what I think. The world already knows what I have done. The world doesn't need my opinions on these things anymore. One day, other people in the world will pick up my ideas and my concerns and maybe the world, it will happen. And, you know, the world could be a happier place. But until such time, I get to shut up and focus on my own life so I <clears throat> wrote a wonderful poem called Dear Poop. <clears throat> dear Poop. Well, dear, dear Poop in particular, could you please stay the <clears throat> off of my boots? I hope I am not violating some law about dear deformation, but go somewhere else. I cannot bear dear poop, not on my rugs. Uh, true, bear poop is even worse and harder to bear than dear poop. But still, have you ever thought that if a bear lost their hair, they'd be a bear bear? Uh, I cannot bear bear shit. It stinks like bear shit. Couldn't they just do it in the woods? Not under my apple tree. I cannot bear bear poop. So please, 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 please. The morning breaks and Bill awakes. He shoulders his shovel and greets his mates who freeze and stare, then bounce away and Bill shovels deer shit one more day. That's Don't Sue Poetry. The phrase, and now for something completely different, seems to get redundant around here. Thank you, sir. There's not an emoji I can find in Zoom that uh, would encompass my eye roll. I'm going to have to write a complaint to Zoom, to Zoom, and they're not going to listen because I don't pay enough money for their service. We are moving on now. We have stage four is this, the first and last stage of Snow Soup readings is to always move on. We're moving, we're walking. Let's go now to Mr. John Stickney. Hey, thank you, Chad. <clears throat> this also is a television related poem. A special guest star. My shadow refuses to schedule proper appointments. It insists on irregular, unplanned, and unlimited appearances. The residuals alone are crippling my finances. I've been doing this thing called the uh, Stafford Challenge, where you write a poem a day. Um, and I think I'm on day 260 two or 264, something like that. And some days th these poems just don't want to be written. And <clears throat> I blame, uh, well, as you can see in this poem, attitude. This poem has been written in pencil since my pen chose this morning of all mornings to give me what psychologists call teenage attitude in its silent Bartleby-like refusal, it said, I'd rather do nothing than what you think is something. I put it in its room, no light, no music, no phone, no internet, that desk drawer over there to take time and think things over in its pointy little head. Thanks. Thank you, John. And if you follow him on uh, 
on Facebook or visit a number of uh, poetry sites like Dead Man's Press. Uh, what else? Uh, the Gas website, uh, Gas Poetry Music. Uh, you'll see his uh, various examples of this 365 challenge, which we used to call the 365 challenge. I never heard it by that name until you brought it up. I wonder if we ripped off of them. But we so are... Chad, yeah. Can I, can I explain what that's about? Um, sure. William, William Stafford was a, um, a poet um, um, in the 60s, 70s, and mm -hmm. early 80s in uh, the Northwest, um, in the Seattle area, um, who wrote a poem a day um, and espoused that practice and has written articles about it and stuff. And poems don't always result. He was a really good poet. Poems don't always result in a finished poem, but he said, you just have to take the time and yes. give into the impulse. And that's that's why one of his, um, I think his son, um, started this as a, a thing called the Stafford Challenge. But it it's is. A, it's, like, it's a nice thing. It's, uh, oh, favorite yeah. Stafford poem. This is, uh, it is definitely, uh, it's definitely a challenge. A lot of people do it. Uh, here in Boston, we started a 365 blog that's uh, private that you can join. And I've joined it in the past and I've actually accomplished 365. In recent years, I try to keep it at least around 200 for my sanity's sake. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, nice. But we are, of course, I usually fall short of this 200 goal, but uh, again, for sanity. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Christiana if she's interested in reading tonight. All right, excellent. Let's welcome, welcome Christiana Chelly. I just asked you to unmute, so it should be hopefully easy for you to unmute. Hmm. Let's try there that we again. go. Okay. Yep, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to just, I've been having chats with chat GPT because humans don't talk to me anymore because they pretty much avoid me uh, because I talk about unpopular topics to talk about. So here's a conversation I've had with ChatGPT today. Please explain Palin defensive ultranationalism and its relation to the U.S. government advising citizens to take a survival of the fittest approach to facing COVID without wearing protection. <clears throat> In relation to the U.S. government's stance during COVID pandemic, particularly regarding mask mandates and public health guidance, this concept might manifest in several ways. Survival of the fittest ideology, the idea that individuals should rely on their own resilience without protective measures can reflect a belief in a natural hierarchy where only the strong survive. This aligns with ultranationalist views that prioritize individualism and self-reliance over collective responsibility. Resistance to external authority. A Palin defensive approach may involve rejecting guidance from health organizations or the scientific community, viewing it as an infringement on personal freedoms. This aligns with ultranationalist tendencies to prioritize national sovereignty, sovereignty over global cooperation. Cultural identity. The narrative surrounding self-sufficiency and personal freedom in the face of a pandemic can be framed as a defensive of American values, as a defense of American values, reinforcing a national identity that values independence and self-reliance. Overall, the interplay between Palin defensive ultranationalism and public health responses highlights how certain ideologies can shape perceptions of risk and responsibility during crisis, often prioritizing individual freedoms at the expense of collective health. Okay. Thank you, Christiana. I would have also accepted the answer. I like cake, you know, but I, I don't. But um, I don't have that much hope for AI. Although I do have to say this: uh, when I was having problems with my with my uh, posts being taken down, I actually couldn't reach anyone real. So I actually conversed with AI, 
and I hate to say it, but it's been more helpful than any uh, than any other uh, device and than any other human uh, person out there. It actually helped me get my stuff fixed. Um, but I figure that answer you got out of AI is going to land uh, Mark Zuckerberg in uh, in front of a Senate committee hearing committee again. Oh well, sucks to be him. Up next on this open mic, uh, let's go to our visual poet from Delaware, Mr. Uh, Robert Fleming. Thank you, Chad. May I use the share screen? Oh yes, let me uh, fix that. Thank you. Tonight I'm bringing another uh, cool reading from Gone with the Wind for the Stone Soup Players. It is the scene when Ashley Wilkes returns from the war and uh, he, Ashley and Scarlett are in a barn outbuilding. And again, Scarlett is trying to um, uh, get Ashley to confess that he loves her. So it is another love scene. I will share um, uh, just a reminder of this is the, the original movie poster for Gone with the Wind. And this is the image of, in the movie, of Ashley Wilkes as a soldier. And this is the setting in the movie where the, uh, the script tonight occurs. And this is a color version of, um, of that. And I'm hoping, since we've had some wonderful uh, uh, readings before from Gone with the Wind that uh, James would be willing to read Ashley Wilkes. Are you willing, James? Wonderful. And Bill, would you read Scarlett O'Hara? Why, it would be my pleasure, sir. Thank you. And I will read the uh, the stage directions. It's it's an exterior paddock at a fence. Scarlet comes over the hill, stops and looks tragically and with affection at the picture of Ashley, who is inadequately and weakly attempting to split rails. She comes to him. Ashley. He has stopped work as she approached him. He laughs. <laughs> They say Abe Lincoln got his start splitting rails. Just think what heights I may climb to once I get the knack. Ashley, the Yankees want $300 more in taxes. What shall we do? Ashley, what is to become of us? What do you think becomes of people when their civilization breaks up? Those who have brains and courage come through all right. Those who haven't are winnowed out. For heaven's sake, Ashley Wilkes, don't stand there talking nonsense at me when it is us who are being widowed out. You're right, Scarlet. Here I am talking, Tommy Rod, about civilization when your Tara's in danger. You've come to me for help, and I've no help to give you. He speaks as a defeated man, his eyes eluding hers without fear or apology, but simply as one overwhelmed by disaster. Yeah. Again, it's you, it's you, James. You're at Scarlet. I... You, Ashley, a coward? What are you afraid of? <laughs> oh, Scarlet. Darling, darling, that is my line. You were supposed to say Scarlet. I am I'm a, a coward. coward. There we go. You, Ashley, a coward? What are you afraid of? Oh, mostly <laughs> of life becoming too real for me, I suppose. Not that I mind splitting rails. His eyes but are off as to some remote star now extinguished. But I do mind very much losing the beauty of that, that life I loved. If the war hadn't come, I'd have spent my life happily buried at Twelve Oaks, 
but the war did come, and I saw my boyhood friends blown to bits. I saw men crumple up in agony when I shot them, and now I find myself in a world which to me is worse than death, a world in which there's no place for me. Oh, I can never make you understand because you don't know the meaning of fear. You never mind facing realities and you never want to escape from them as I do. Escape? She turns a quick, guilty look at the house. Then, oh, Ash, oh, continues Scarlet. Oh, Ashley, you are wrong. I do want to escape too. I am very very tired of it all. I've struggled for food and for money. I have weeded and hoed and picked cotton till I can't stand it for another minute. I tell you, Ashley, the South is dead. It's dead. The Yankees and the carpetback have got it all. There's nothing left for us. Ashley, who has been looking at her in disbelief, now peers at her sharply as she lays her hand feverishly, urgently on his arm. Oh, Ashley, let's run away. We could go to Mexico. They want to offer through the Mexican army, and, and we could be so happy there. Ashley, I'd work for you. I'd do anything for you. You know, you don't love Melanie. You told me you loved me that day at 12 Oaks. And anyway, Melanie can. Dr. Mead told me she couldn't ever have many more children. And I could give you. Ashley is startled. His eyes fall. Oh, can't we ever forget that day at 12 Oaks? Do you think I could forget it? Have you forgotten it? Could you honestly say that you don't love me? Ashley draws a deep breath then. No, I don't love you. <laughs> It's a lie. <laughs> His voice quiet. Well, even if it is a lie, do you think I could go off and leave Melanie and the baby? Break Melanie's heart? Scarlet, are you mad? You couldn't give your father and the girls. You couldn't leave I could the leave them. I am sick of them. I'm tired of them. Yes, you're sick and tired. That's why you're talking this way. You've carried the load for all of us. But from now on, I'm going to be more help to you. I promise. There's only one way you can help me. Take me away from here. There's nothing to keep us here no more. Nothing. Nothing except honor. She looks at him defeated and baffled, turns away drops her head in her hands, and starts to cry. It is the first time Ashley has seen any weakness in her. He goes to her swiftly and takes her in his arms, cradling her comfortly, pressing her head to his heart, whispering, Oh dear, oh dear, my brave dear darling, oh no, don't cry, you mustn't. No, don't cry. <laughs> don't, don't, no, don't. You do love me. You do love me. Say it. Don't. Don't. Say it. You love me. Say it. <laughs> Suddenly he shakes her, shakes her until her hair tumbles down through her shoulders. We won't do this. I tell you, we won't do it. And he f fairly throws her clear of him. It won't happen again. I'll take Melanie and the baby and go. Scarlet, obvious to what he's saying and laughing triumphantly. You love me, say it. Say it, you love me. You love me. You love me, say it. Say it. <laughs> All right, I'll say it. I love your courage and your stubbornness. I love them so much that a moment ago I could have forgotten the best wife a man ever had, but Scarlet, I'm not going to forget her. Then there's nothing left for me. Nothing to fight for. Nothing to live for. Yes, there is something. Something you love better than me, though you may not know it. He stoops quickly, scrapes up a handful of moist earth, and presses it into the palm of her hand. Para. 
She's looking at her handful of earth, then her head comes up. Why, yes, I still have this. You needn't go. I won't have you all starve simply because I threw myself at your head. It won't happen again. She walks away from him towards the covered way. Thank you. That was a scene from the oh, original wow. text from uh, Gone with the Wind between Ashley Wilkes and Scarlett O'Hara by the Stone Soup Players. Cut and scene. We, uh, <laughs> we're here now. Uh, we're getting close to the end uh, and, and the feature. Hope you all stay for him. He's been listening to you all attentively. And uh, I want to ask Jeff Taylor if he's available to read now. Hey, I'm just listening tonight, Chad. Oh, okay, no problem. Uh, then let, let's go to our musical interlude with uh, Mr. Ethan Mackler. Hold on. Thank you so much, Mr. Mackler. And now, uh, second to last person on the open mic, let's go to the stylings of uh, Mr. John Wesick. Clam guts and mango steam. 
Chainsaw fish ply the muddy Irrawaddy, past pink dolphins and drug lords' hippos, to spawn upstream and die. Deep among the mangosteen trees, the Mojado brothers, Piso and Seco, toss clam guts into a campfire. Flesh splits and sizzles in this furnace of disappointment. The brothers guzzle their gin and tonic free. Now the ne Nephilim's mosquitoes bat their heads against primus lanterns, oblivious to the cloying scents of kerosene smoke and ammonia compounds. Must every poem be its own exorcism? Buzzed on incense and Latin, lizard brains diagram prison sentences and hang philosophers on a frame of space and time, while Aristotelian logic folds furlongs and fortnights over stretcher bars before stapling and sealing with gesso. Meanwhile, the mad scientist plots his escape from Plato's cave. He will either signal aliens from planet Remolod with the clock radio, or reanimate a woolly mammoth using DNA from freeze-dyed Suvaki. Somewhere in the constellation Sagittarius, Saturn forgot her shopping list, Pterodactyl burgers, spinach tartare, and Titan's beloved methane chip cookies left behind like a geosynchronous satellite painting an ocean of webbed toes with floor wax. When asked why she searches under Epsilon Sagittarii, Saturn replies, that's where the light is. A food chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Thank you, Mr. Wezek. And now, before we get to our feature tonight, thank you, Ted. Thanks to everyone who's participated. Thanks to everyone who's listening, whether you're inside the Zoom chat doing so, or if you're one of the, those uh, listening to us from the uh, Facebook live stream, or to fast forward it about 12 hours from now, uh, if you're one of the people listening to us after the show on YouTube. Going to bring you to Mr. James Van Loy. Um, check out Oddball Magazine for a future. Uh, excuse me, for any um, for any if you have any interest in uh, submitting your work, Oddball Magazine is a great place to check out. Uh, with one place that actually has poet columnists, and one of them is uh, here with us now, and he's going to be. Um, Finishing off the open mic, you can check out his poem column, It's All One Thing, which is published every Thursday without fail, for the most part. <laughs> if, if there's any fail, it's usually my fault. Um, every uh, Thursday morning at 11 a.m., let's welcome and thank Mr. James Van Loy. Thanks, Chad. So I've got a poem here uh, called Pure projection. Pure projection. That's just the way it is now, that all the masks are so off. Even though nothing changes, a Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, skeletons coming up everywhere, wearing Patriot famous numbers and Bruins and Celtic t-shirts and those super immune system bats and spiders cobwebs and caves, no wonder everyone is too afraid to talk about what's so really going on and on and on again and again, showing all of us their true colors. There's Jolly Roger and the skull and crossbones X marks the exact spot to which pure projection has led us. Yes, we're out on the old borderline with the laser screens blazing away. And, uh, <clears throat> Let me see if I can find something here for you. I 
had this all out and it closed on me. But I'll, I'll sing this song because, you know, they were carrying uh, all these signs at the Republican convention saying uh, that they wanted to have mass deportations. And this is, uh, this is a song from this Dutch hippie named Armand. They're one of their kind of uh, um, um, cabaret, cabaret hippies uh, from the Dutch culture. And he has this song called Alls alle grenzen open gun when all borders are open. Alls alle grenzen open gun van landen grout and klein. Alls er geen muur en muur bestands en shall pass free design. Alls alle mensen samen gun van landen grout and klein. Alls mine up and alert for stand and shall press pretty sun. Not get the clock at Bernie on for all or last to stride. Not get the clock at Bernie on for all the folks to die. That all at grins and open gun van London grow and twine. That block and sort of carver stand and shall press pretty sun. And for all you've been long a pracking and steeply too long. The world my talk and own fun da demons and word so bang. All's all a grins and open gun round London growth and time. All there gain beer and beer boost on none shall best pay design. All solemn men's and some and gun one London growth and climb. Os mine up condor their first and done shall pass it is fine. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's actually really true when people can actually pass freely, uh, we'll all maybe finally find some peace. Thank you. Oh. Huh. Thank you so much, Mr. James Van Loy. And uh, stay tuned as we announce future features for the rest of the um for the rest of October leading up to voting day we uh we'll probably be announcing some additional uh additional news items regarding uh readings and memorial services going around uh Boston uh in the next week or so for instance regarding uh the late Glenn Lucci Furman, there is going to be a uh, service being held this uh, Sunday, this Monday, actually, on Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, that's going to be held at the Armory in Somerville. For anyone who's interested, we'll hopefully, there'll be some interest, there'll be more, more information uh, posted uh, tomorrow, and as I understand it, uh, some of Lucci's family are coming in for the tribute as well. I also posted some, uh, at least one video piece from uh, Lucci when he performed back uh, in two, 2013. And uh, hopefully more of his work is going to resurface and uh, come up. So looking forward to that and to uh, giving tribute to Lucci with friends. We're going to be uh, as I said, there'll be more announcements here on the Stone Soup site as well. So hopefully a couple more calls for submissions. And there's some deadlines impending as well. I think Instant Noodles deadline is uh, next week as well, next Tuesday. But enough of that. Let us uh, get to the reason we are here. My uh, reflexes are slow tonight. So we are introducing Nora Balatsky, who is um, who is a poet, writer, essayist, uh, political commentator. If any of you follow Substacks, you can follow his uh, work on He's one of the writers on public notice, as well as his own uh, Substack, the aptly and uh, named after my own heart, Everything is Horrible. Uh, he is... Uh, been a journalist, art critic. He's written for so many uh, news sites, websites, fan sites. Um, but as a uh, as a freelance writer in Chicago, his first full length collection of poetry came out this year. Not Ak, 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 Ak I think is how you say it. 
I, I, I don't know why I'm stumbling over that. It's the K and the H. I keep on wanting to say Ankh, but I don't know. But uh, not Akvatova from Ben Yuda Press, um, which is a strong seller on Amazon. I'm grabbing my copy this week. He has chapbooks published and or forthcoming with Origami Poems Project, Project which is actually located here in uh, New England, Rhode Island specifically. And uh, J L J and McD Communications. Uh the very enigmatic publisher who uh, puts out journals uh, both in print and PDF. I have actually have something with him this year. I have not heard back from him, so I wish you luck on that. But uh, he's had been published in Oddball. He'll, 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 get, he'll get back to you. He, hopefully. Hopefully it's a good Hopefully it's a, he will. It's a, with a good answer. Um, uh, so Noah has been published in a number of, uh, local publications here in New England, such as Oddball, Stone's Throw, uh, more coming, I hope, uh, check his work out and check his, he's one of the last good things about the X Twitter site. And, um, uh, I'm sure he'll be sharing you, uh, many links to his, uh, work where you can support him. So without any further ado, put your hands together. Let's say 30, 40 times virtually audibly, however you like for Noah Berleski. Hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for everybody for coming out. I actually, uh, I hardly ever do readings, so um, it's nice to have people out and you know bear with me since I'm I'm not that practiced at it. Um, as Chad said, I have a book out called Not Akmatova from Ben Yehuda Press, which you can get from the press site or from Amazon or other outlets. Um, uh, it's a collection of um, kind of translations, responses, arguments with Anna Akhmatova, who was a major poet in Russia in the first half of the 20th century. Um, you know, my family is from Russia originally, or many of them are, um, but they left for the reasons that Jewish people usually leave Russia in the past. Um, so the book's Akhmatova was not Jewish. Um, so it's kind of about how she, you know russia russian poetry is and it's not my tradition and how i don't read russian anymore uh so it's kind of thinking about the way di diaspora is valuable or how it's thought about um anyway so this first one is a sonnet um it's a trans sort of a loose, loose translation of akhmatova's poem uh, lot's wife The righteous man followed God's, God's messenger, huge and terrible, like a black mountain. His great back to Lot's wife was sorrow and fear. She longed to stop and see just once again the white spires of her home, the place in the square where she sang to her children, the windows of the house where in joy and pain she gave birth to her children. And so she turned back for one last sight. Her eyes like those windows were empty. Her body was a pillar of salt bleached white. Her feet were brooded in place like a memory. We aren't supposed to mourn her. She's a fool and so many others burned. They say do not look towards her who defied God and turned. All right. And uh, this is another sort of translation uh, called from Akhmatova called White Dove. Um, White Dove. He was jealous and tender and jealous. He loved me like the sun burns the earth. My white dove sang of a time before us, so he murdered that white bird. As the red sun set, he said, laugh, love, rejoice, sing, and write poetry. So I dug a grave for my white dove by the well near the alder tree. I promised him never to grieve, but my words and my heart turned to stone. The well is cold, I can't seem to leave. Her voice calls, sweet, sad, and alone. All right, I think I've got another. Oh, okay, so this next one is not exactly a translation. It's a villanelle, which is sort of collaged from the preface to Akhmatova's poem called Requiem, which was about her experiences in the Stalinist purges. She, her, uh, you know, her poetry was banned and her husband, one of her husbands was disappeared. 
and her son was in prison for a long time. Um, so this is called Instead of an Epitaph. Can you describe this? The stupor, the cold, the gate? I can, yes. A woman with blue lips did not know my name. Can you describe this? Each order is a kiss, and every love an iron grate. I can, yes. The faces are a list that's never read. They wait. Can you describe this? Her eyes know nothing yet. Knowledge is always what late. I can, yes. They're all dead now. The mist lies on them like a weight. Can you describe this? I can, yes. And not sure if you can hear my dog in the background, but she's she's enthusiastic about the poem, I guess, or something. <laughs> anyway, this last one, this uh, this this next one is the last poem in the book. Um, sort of a semi-confessional summing up. Sorry. Okay, it's called To Anna, Not to Anna. I just learned that my grandmother spoke Russian, like her ancestors who spoke Russian, when they did not speak something else. Russians gave them orders till they left the language lying behind, like blood on the snow shaking its fists. I don't pick up anything that is mine because nothing that drops on the earth like rainwater is mine if it fills up the hollows. It is only the water that runs off the earth, speaking its own language like frogs in the water, croaking in trees and on the horizon. We left and we didn't take anything with us, and now the homelessness you gave us is ours, which includes the beauty and misery pooling in the hollows. It includes the language taken from my tongue, which speaks now, for you, not for you, for the fish in the trees who own the world that they're no part of. All right, so... All right, so kind of a something different here. Um, moving away from my not Akwatova, this next one is a pantoum which uses collaged lines from the uh, Poetry Foundation website. Um, it's from a little chat book called Superintelligence, which was published actually by L. J. McT Communications. Um, so it's kind of turning marketing copy for poetry into poetry of, of some sort. It's a little long and lines repeat. I don't know. I'm not really sure this is sort of thinking about it. Was this the best one to read? But I, I guess it's here. So anyway, uh, be kind. Um, it's called Poetry Has a Foundation in the Website of Your Heart. She st stripped away the polite veneer of surgical collegiality and canceled the boundaries between the Guggenheim and Village Voice, even as Poetry founded a new website in the heart, which primly turned the pages of Buddha T. Cozy's from Lenore. Cancel then the boundary between the Guggenheim and village voice with the sidely postmodern self-conscious Slavic pragmatism, primly turning the pages of Buddha T. Cozy's as Lenore attends Fulbright inclusive Aikido at the Iowa Pavilion. The decidedly postmodern self-conscious Slavic pragmatism designed and facilitated collaborative hometowns which attend Fulbright inclusive Aikido at the Iowa Pavilion. Heroic responsibilities in a dull and convex Yale design and facilitate collaborative hometowns. Duende is the Harvard of National Public Radio with heroics responsibilities in a dull and convex Yale titled Scathing Family Life, a Global Political Event. Duende to Harvard to National Public Radio to the act of naming eco-literacy a meditative generalization. Can scathing family life be a global political event? Can prestigious arts endowments be wildly rebellious? The act of naming eco-literacy and meditative generalizations is a great American pastime like a volatile family farm where prestigious arts endowments graze wildly rebellious on the phenomenon of methane and Phillips Exeter prestige. The great American pastime of volatile family farms celebrates working class pertness embodied by the feminist counterculture where the phenomenon of methane and Phillips Exeter prestige flows like blogging turning 40 in obscurely thrusting vigor. We celebrate the working class pertness embodied in feminist counterculture and the almost Chinese incommodiousness of the contemporary West. We flow like blogging turning 40 in obscurely thrusting vigor, dividing our time between multicultural commitments and a solemn open marriage. Chinese incommodiousness, the contemporary West, the highest purpose of who we are or can fuck as a nation, 
divided our time like multicultural commitments in a solemn open marriage. Yes, in painterly library journals that we honor for their freedom. The highest purpose of who we are and must fuck as a nation is set to music by John Williams and President Bill Clinton, whose painterly library journals still honor all of freedom. The absurd death lurking in Phi Beta Kappa's business is the music of John Williams, yet President Bill Clinton seeks the visionary latrines for a fragment of Paris Commune, and the absurd death lurking in Phi Beta Kappa's business is a cyborg who comes of AIDS and chants, not a fan of Facebook. Visionary latrines seek for a fragment of Paris Commune and the moral emasculation of the sublime blue pencil, and cyborg coming of age is chanting like a fan who's not on Facebook. A generation lost in soirees also yielded success at moral emasculation. The great sublime blue pencil explores the vast topography of flirty image text, where a generation lost its soirees and yields in success in the arousing controversy of fascist common core state standards. The vast topographic exploration of flirty image text carries with it discomfort like every mobile app with their arousing controversies. Fascist common core state standards are strangely familiar conference panels. There within the mind, we carry our discomfort like every mobile app to the very deepest source of audio subscribers. The strange is a familiar conference panel of the mind, intensity, power, library of Congress, social problems. These are the deepest sources of our audio subscribers. A mother has lost a genius grant in a Getty image of flamenco. The intensity and power of the Library of Congress's social problems are a caged heart waiting for a chancellor to podcast about mothers lost to genius grants, Getty images, and flamenco. As third world liberation movements overthrow New Yorker invites, the caged heart waits for the chancellor while podcasts address literary postcards to teeming Jewish refugees. Third world liberation movements will invite some sad New Yorker to the fidelity and deposit afterlife of a molting Harold Bloom, who addresses literary postcards to teams of Jewish refugees. Even in fluctuation, the Black Performance Masterclass faithfully deposits molting, blooming Harold's afterlife, remarked the hippie intensive with its motherless grim bathos, detecting fluctuations in the Black Performance Masterclass. Greatest X-ray probings in the conventional individual, mark the hippie intensive with its motherless grim bathos, while bodies and pleasures burst from exalted facsimile, probing like righteous x-rays in the individual convention, hall of love, childhood, and amatory thyroid laureates. Bodies and pleasures burst from exalted facsimile, which subscribe radical human intimacy to new lonely syntax letters. As they haul your love, your childhood, your amatory thyroid laureates to the broad platonic essence of a career collage. Subscribe to radical human intimacy newsletter for syntax alone and surgically strip the plate veneer of collegial finesse. Then you may ignore the broad platonic essence, the career and the collage, for poetry has a foundation in the website of your heart. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this one's very different again. Um, this next one's a kind of children's story poem. I wrote some time back. Uh, it appeared in Worlds of Possibility in 2023, I think. Um, yeah, I kind of wrote it for my daughter because she. this was some years back. She's 21 now, so she's not necessarily listening to children's stories. But um, yeah, at the time she was really into it and actually memorized the whole thing, which was, which was gratifying. <laughs> anyway, it's called One Day Gravity Stopped. And there's even like narrative, so... <laughs> Easier to follow, I guess. Anyway, one day gravity stopped. The hedgehogs were very confused. To start with, they all began to float. Hedgehogs are not used to floating. Many of them curled into balls, but that did not help much. Other things floated too, for example, underwear. Also rocks, candy wrappers, omelets, and beetles. When Aunt Esmeralda floated past, she said, there's a lot of junk up here floating around. And she was right. Some of the hedgehogs tied themselves to trees, then they drifted up like hedgehog balloons. This was undignified, but at least they knew where they were when they woke up in the morning. Another problem was water. Without gravity, the water in the pond rolled into balls and drifted into the air. This made it hard to drink, even without having to dodge the floating fish. Also without gravity, all the air in the world went off into space. It is hard to breathe without air. Luckily, the hedgehogs had special helmets, so they were all right for a while. They lent some helmets to the birds too, if the birds asked politely. At night, the hedgehogs watched the moon getting further and further away. 
Without gravity, it had gotten cranky and decided to set off on its own. Then gravity came back. The hedgehogs were very confused. Many of them fell down. That hurt, but overall they were happy to have gravity back again. So they had a party with cake. Uh, <laughs> bravo! Bravo! <laughs> All right. Uh... So from a children's story, this one, we go to one that's really not for kids at all. Uh, this appeared in a magazine called DOR, which is also Lackland's thing. Um, so um, this is called Time Will Fuck You Blues. Uh, time won't slow down. Time doesn't stop. Time never slows down. It never fucking stops. All that not turning back will spin you like a fucking top. I get up today like I got up before. I get up today just like I got up before. Every night I lie down like closing another fucking door. Winter comes every year and I don't know what's next. Winter comes most years and I never know what's next. Just winter then winter and another fucking winter on deck. Make a fucking will, lie down and fucking die. Make a fucking testament, sprawl out and fucking die. Nothing you own is yours, so say good fucking bye. All right. <laughs> Oh, and uh, right. Okay, this next one is uh, appeared in Gabby and Min's Literary Review. Um, it was kind of for my wife, who, who who did in fact find it kind of amusing. She doesn't always like my poetry, but she liked this one okay. <laughs> it's called True Love. When you fall in love with love, your heart pumps itself through its own heart valve, up through your heart tubes to your brain. You see stars dripping blood and pumping like a heart. And through your... Through the stars, your wife comes walking and she says, what's wrong with you? She pulls your heart out of your nose. She shreds it into tiny pieces and shakes it on her Doritos. This is just what I wanted, she says. I love this. You love her too. Uh, okay. Uh, this is sort of a socialist rant, I guess. Um, I think it appeared in New Feathers originally. It's called, I should have been working, but I wrote this instead. We're always thinking about the miners and their headlamps showing us what's real, like a hard hat made out of Marx and a lunchbox made of Bob Dylan. In the dark, in the shaft, in the earth, the economists skitter in the walls and the miners who are in the walls, chipping blue-black blood from their elbows and rising up in the steam shovels, grinding and belching on cable news. Elbowless bodies roll over each other, striking sp sad sparks, the hard hats click together down the slope into the Walmart parking lot, burying the cars of greeters who aren't real and teachers moonlighting as baristas like ghosts in the gross domestic product. Far, far above the distant stars drive themselves like Tesla's gently exploding. We all look up because we won't get paid if we look down. Next bend and nod, sunflowers shifting on the subway platform, swaying on the subway, cars shuffling through the subway doors and into the skyscraper canyons. It's not sun, It's not real, sunflowers don't go to work. They don't wear hard hats, they cannot type, their drab leaves hang limply, they are sorry. Only mine owners go to work and possibly Mark Zuckerberg. They work making things out of people like Amazon boxes and slag heaps. They say there's quicksand on the top, if you climb there you will be sucked down into the coal rod and shale. Clangs in your lungs, it hammers out dreams in the barrow, shadows on the wall. It's not real, there are no shadows. The shadows have been pulled down. They will be burned for fuel. They will be burned so no one will see them. Being useless, being useful, not working. The one real thing. And Okay. <clears throat> I think I just got a couple more here. This is actually, this is a tribute to Kenny G. <laughs> Great Jewish musician. Um, first appeared in Touch the Donkey, which is a above ground press title. Got reprinted in memoir mixtapes. Um, it was inspired by Penny Penny Lane's kind of awesome documentary called "Listening to Kenny G," um, which uh, reconciled me to my to my. I don't know if it's quite love, but but appreciation of Kenny G. Um, it's called "Practice Makes Kenny G." Kenny G is waiting with his sax saxophone by the mall fountain. He is always with his saxophone waiting by the mall fountain. He is always ready to play by the mall fountain with fluorescent lights and the coins tinkling in the fountain near the koi sliding around the coins like flashes of fluorescent light. Kenny G practices four hours a day by the fountain. He doesn't really like music, but he likes practicing by the fountain. 
When you ask him what he loves about music, he said he loved to think about the musicians practicing. They wander around the mall with their saxophones practicing, slipping around each other like coins flashing in light. Practice is a melody like musicians underwater turning a wheel. The wheel is a melody from which coins fall like fish practicing in the mall fountain. Their gills flutter because they are practicing to turn a wheel connected to a pulley connected to the lights. The lights flicker because they are practicing falling like coins. The fountain practices making different shapes out of water. The water practices tossing notes into Kenny G like koi. Oh, okay. And I think this is the last one. Um, based on a real incident, uh, I think it first appeared in Welter online. And my dog, who you may or may not have heard, shows up. <laughs> so uh, it's called No Scones. We wanted to buy the British Vogue with Timothy Chalamet on the cover, but they did not have the British Vogue with Timothy Chalamet on the cover. The day is sexless and without glamour. The lumpy pit bulls cry at the door because they are not greyhounds. The classical guitarist plays a mournful song on a guitar that is not even blue. The queen is dead and we have to read the Vogue Memorial Edition and nothing else out here on the patio that is too small, out here with large-eyed pigeons who do not comprehend why they have been scattered on the pavement like discarded feathery things beneath a sky so sconeless. All right, and that's it. Uh, thank you all so much for turning in. Uh, and thank you, Chad, for having me. Uh, again, my book is called Not, Not Akmatofa, and it's on Amazon at the, at the Ben Yehuda Press site. Uh, oh, right, and my chat book, Super Intelligence, with the uh, with the really long collage poem, which maybe I shouldn't have read, but it might be better if you read it on the page. Uh, great, and you can follow my sub stack at Everything is Horrible. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks again. I'll be, really I'll be sending that. out a plethora of links uh, tonight, and if you uh, want to give your um, if you want to give your PayPal for any donations, you're more than welcome to. Uh, oh, incidentally, okay. everything everything is horrible. Is a um, is a Substack subscriptions uh, subscription based site, uh, so you can subscribe for free or you can pay for additional services. And uh, Noah is an incredibly prolific writer has something up almost every day and would be at poetry or uh, works for public notice and public notice is a great uh, political commentary site um, to, uh, to be part of and to subscribe to as well. So um, definitely recommend that and any of his uh, sites, I'll definitely link the book uh, later on tomorrow when we, uh, um, uh, your, your first full link book that is tomorrow once we um, put up the video and the, um, and the fights and the video and the um pictures for tonight but um so what are so what is your next project what is the um next big book that you think um oh god is, is coming <laughs> close is coming close to fruition um well i'm kind of working on a sort of follow-up to not akmatova maybe which is sort of a bunch of responses to um other jewish poets so kind of um, some translations, some kind of arguments, some sort of inspired by. So I've been reading Heinrich Hind, who's great, and kind of writing little poems based on that. Uh, yeah, I guess that's my next poetry thing. Well, we wish you luck with that, and um, we'll. I'll definitely be uh, pushing for people to read you more, and uh, you should definitely check him out on uh, Substack. Check out. Um, any of his works. Um, if you follow him on X, I know X is a site you have to kind of hold your nose and uh, wear <laughs> rubber gloves and boots to uh, be on. But uh, subscribing to Noah's um, uh, Twitter account, I can't believe I just called it X. I'm going to have to go back and delete that. Um, oh, God, I, I deserve... I deserve everything I get for the next 24 hours. That, that, that just rained bad luck on me. But um, definitely subscribe to his work and... Um, you will and you will not regret it. Um, we had two people. I think they might be friends of yours who uh, I don't know if they want to read on uh, what sometimes I do as the second half of the open mic. Uh, read a roundtree if you're if you're interested or uh, the the person we call Hexpad. Um, if either of you want to read, um, you can unmute and uh, and offer your and offer your words. If not, we will. Um, 
we will dismiss ourselves for the night on on an amazing. Does anybody? Note. I mean, then, oh, if anybody wants to, I don't know. Do you know? People can ask me questions if they want. I don't know that there's. Actually, questions. does anyone have any questions? Unless someone besides Robert Fleming answer for a question first, because Robert's gonna take you to take you for a ride. <laughs> I have a question for you, Noah. Go for it. I'm I'm Jewish, also from uh -huh. descent, and I had curly hair like you called a Jufro. Mm -hmm. But I lost all my curly hair at about age 26. And you share that you were older than 26. What's your secret for keeping all your Jufro? I just got lucky, I guess. My brother's bald. Oh. I mean, I got I got sort of crappy genetics in other ways. I have all sorts of health problems. But oh, I, thought, I thought maybe there was a prayer that you knew that was a secret. No, just just blind luck. Thank I'm you. I'm 53 actually. So, Rita yeah. Roundtree, Rita Roundtree commented, uh, "His hair is amazing. It's it's true." So, uh, huh. and, and and given my condition of my hair, anyone who has hair looks amazing. It's true. Um, or if they just have a cool hat. Hi, Ethan. Um, I think uh, John Stickney had a uh, question. He raised his hand. Yes, I I was wondering, but you mentioned that your family came over from from Russia, and and, uh, and what year did they come over? And did you well, this, speak Russian at any point? In your I life? have never spoken Russian. I think my grandmother, my dad's my dad's mother, uh, still spoke Russian and Yiddish and a couple other languages, maybe. But it's actually my great grandparents who came over. So oh. it's like 18, 1890s. Wow. Um, probably. Okay. So we've been here a long time. Yeah. So that was from Eastern Europe and uh and Russia. Um, I think my last name, which Berlatsky means barge hauler, we think. But yeah, nobody nobody speaks Russian anymore. And we've been here a long time. You know, yeah. people don't people kind of don't. I mean, I think we sort of had distant relatives who were my dad's third cousins or second cousins or something who, who were in the Holocaust, but most of my family was over here already. So okay. you just, you got out because of the programs. Huh? I presume that's why, you know, I mean, yeah. you did, we don't have a lot of records, but right. I mean, that's why, that's why Jewish people left, right? Because right. the 1890s I mean, historically, were historically, that's, that's the time period yeah. where. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. And so um, do you guys, speak yiddish is there a tradition of nothing no okay. no because we are there, very we are very assimilated <laughs> there there is um recently been a lot of translations of of early jewish and yiddish poetry uh, on both in new york and in la um, yeah actually i'm going to do a reading with uh merle bachman um in bloomington indiana um, who's uh, who also has a book out from Ben Yehuda Press, and uh, she did translations of okay. Rosa Neva Jaroska. I don't know how to pronounce her name, but it's a pretty great book. Yeah, and they're, they're, it's a bilingual Yiddish English yeah. edition. Um, and yeah, she was somebody who um, Rosa, this this Yiddish poet, was somebody who was born in Russia and then moved to Poland and spent some time in Poland and then moved to the U.S. and was all over the U.S. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. Very rich tradition. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I have I have one more question about you being an immigrant. Uh, when my uh, father's father uh, left Poland and got ready to board the, the boat, they changed his family's last name and then when he arrived in Canada, they changed his last name again. When your family immigrated from Russia to the United States, what was your last name changed and uh, what was it originally? Well, Berlatsky is, is the original name. <laughs> um, my understanding is that um, the idea that the, uh, that the, People at the the that officials change people's names. That's kind of a myth. That didn't really happen that much. What happened was the people changed their own names. 
um, because they want didn't want to be recognized as Jewish for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, and my actually my my on my mother's side, her parents uh, they changed their name. Yeah, I mean they changed their name to Winters um, mm -hmm. because he was a uh, he'd been in the army. You know he was drafted, and he was an engineer in the army. Um, and he ended up being a, a patent attorney. He was very successful. Uh, but, you know, he felt like he and I think my grandmother felt like being identifiable as Jewish was going to be a barrier for them. So she changed their name. They changed their name. Um, Thank you. And I think. Thank felt you for letting me know when my grandfather told me about all the name changes it was a story to tell a child. Uh, 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 sorry your about that. Would, no. Maybe your grandfather is in <laughs> hiding, and that's the whole reason. <laughs> you know, people didn't. People had real reasons to want to change their name and be yeah. unrecognizable, but also I, didn't I mean, necessarily in, want in to. Part it, in part, it was the purposeful changing of names. The other part of it is the inability to um, write your name in English. So. A lot of stuff ended up being phonetic by the people filling out the forms. So there were there were changes that way too. So it wasn't purposeful. It was convenient, I guess. Now I, I worked with a guy who was born in Russia. His family was Russian, and they changed the way they spelt their name so they could get out of Russia and go to Israel by claiming that they were Jewish, oh, though wow. they weren't Jewish. <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, Christ Christiana, did you have a question? Oh, let me um, let me unmute you. Let me ask you to unmute, then you can unmute. Now the board's yours. Hi, Noah. Hi. Um, I'm Christiana, and a couple of days ago, I heard a question, and I haven't been able to come to an answer yet. I think it's a good question to ask. So. Um, if there was something you wanted, you just wanted everyone by default that you met to just know about you, what would that be? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, I think I probably, yeah. Uh, I'm not enough of an, of an extrovert to want everybody to know anything about me. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 yeah, probably I'm more on the, you know. Keep inf information segregated, I guess. So. Okay. Yeah. And with that, no more questions. Get that camera out of his face. All okay. right. <laughs> well, thanks again. It was great. It was great doing this. Thanks for all for listening. Thank you, Noah. And thanks to everyone for a great night. Uh, Stone Soup is back. Hopefully we're going to have some feisty, more feisty features coming up for the rest of uh, October and for November for uh, we're either going to do the democracy benefit issue for uh, irony's sake or for real. Uh, thank you guys very much. Doing the obligatory wave, waving, waving goodbye to Noah. The uh, next, thank next you, feature Noah. announcements. Next feature announcements will uh, be coming very shortly. Now that I can actually speak more than ten words without hacking a hacking cough, and uh, thank mm -hmm. you guys very much for tonight. It could be like this every week. All we need is you. Enjoy yourselves, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and have yourselves a great night. Thanks to everyone who came out, whether it was Thank to you. read or to listen. And we'll talk to you later. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Show's over. See you next time.